Hello and welcome to my channel. If you are new to my channel, I am Kita. I talk about true crime cases. And today's case is one that surprisingly not that many people are familiar with. I personally was not familiar with this case until I watched it on Netflix, but when I watched it, I was very surprised and let's just say this case has a lot of twist and turns. The t main two people in this case are not what you would expect the outcome to be with each other. Let's just say that and I think there's going to be a lot of comments below with different opinions so please feel free to share your opinions and your honest thoughts about this case because I was definitely shocked who the killer ended up being and their reasoning behind it. It's just like I said, this case has a lot of twists and turns. So this case is called Killer Sally on Netflix. The case involves two bodybuilders who fell in love and they had the world of fitness in their hands. Today we are going to be talking about Sally McNeil and Ray McNeil. This case and the tragic outcome of it and their relationship, the cheating allegations, and so much more will have many of you in the comments, like I said, feeling conflicted, and you guys are gonna have all sorts of different opinions. Of course, at the end of this video, I will be sharing my thoughts and opinions on the case, and without further ado, let's get right into the case. Sally, from a very young age, was described as a very tough girl. She grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, to which she described in a very violent home. Allegedly, her father would abuse her and her mother growing up. Sally thought that this type of behavior was normal in a relationship because unfortunately she grew up being abused and seeing her mother abused, so Sally thought, okay, this behavior is normal. She was very, very athletic. From a young age, Sally not only loved sports, but she was really good at it. She was that girl in the gym that could give the boys a run for her money for sure. I don't know about you guys, but I was the one in the gym who when everybody was running laps, I was walking trying to not be noticed somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> she attended Deerhoof High School, I hope I'm saying that right, in Pennsylvania, where she was on the school school swimming team, diving team, and track and field team. After graduating high school, Sally wanted to further her passion for sports and athleticism by becoming a future gym teacher. So she enrolled at East Stroudsburg State College. Unfortunately, after three years of attending college, Sally couldn't afford to attend anymore, she couldn't afford her education anymore, and she decided to drop out of college. Instead, she grew an interest in the idea of joining the military. During her time in the military, Sally met her first husband, Anthony Loden. They were married a total of four years and had three children together, Shantina, John, and a third child who was put up for adoption. And for protection of that child's identity, I did not research further about the name of that third child that was put up for adoption. Um, I'm sure it's out there and you can find it somewhere, but I just chose not to do that. While there isn't a specific known reason to why Sally and her first husband divorced, the New York Daily News reports that Sally was arrested in 1990 for brandishing a firearm at Loudon and smashing the windows of his vehicle with a metal bar. Sally claims that the marriage was violent and she ultimately won full custody in court of their two children, John and Shantina. After this divorce, Sally transferred to Camp Pedleton. This is where she would meet her second husband, Ray McNeil. Sally began to first embark on bodybuilding while she was at this camp. Through bodybuilding, a friend ended up basically introducing her to Ray. Ray immediately off the bat was not only impressed by Sally's physique and how tough she was, but how well that she was doing in the bodybuilding competition world 
and he basically was like, yeah, I'm going to make that girl mine. So they hit it off. They dated for about two months before getting married. But friends of this couple really did witness that they were in love with each other in the beginning. Ray was super charming with her kids and Sally always dreamed of having this like picture perfect family and Ray gave her that dream when they first met. Initially, Ray helped Sally feel supported with her career, with accepting her kids. They had basically, like I said, the whole world in their hands. Everything was perfect. They moved to Oceanside, California with their two children and they began starting a life together. After this point, finding a home together, Sally wanted to help Ray ultimately to leave the Marines and focus on settling down with her. So she picked up a job that she enjoyed in a similar kind of world of wrestling. I don't mean like WWE wrestler, like many of you are probably familiar with. She basically had a side hustle where she made up to $300 an hour wrestling men on video. Yep, $300. So, while some of you may be listening to this video like, hold up, wait a minute, that's weird, and not my man or not my woman would be doing that. Sally was basically bringing in that dough, okay, to put it lightly. But between bodybuilding and doing this on the side, she was able to fund Ray, her husband's bodybuilding career. She described having to pay for the shows that he was attending. She was buying him tons of protein, like protein shakes, steaks, chicken, rice, you know, the whole meal plan that he needed to be gaining muscle as quickly as he was. And since Ray was a rookie in the bodybuilding competitions, he was having to pay for his slots in these shows instead of being paid. So just like starting out with YouTube or TikTok or something in the professional world, you have to invest in it first before you become so good or before you have a certain amount of followers or before you win a certain amount of competitions where then you're the one that they're wanting to pay to be in their shows. This money that she was making doing this was also helping pay for his slots in these shows ultimately if ray didn't like what she was doing he basically just had to be quiet about it because there was no question that what she was doing was funding his life too so there's even a video here i'll insert a screenshot of ray and sally wrestling in a video so that she could promote it like for what she does. And as a warning, right now we will be discussing some of the violent allegations between Ray and Sally detailed by her and their friends. So if that's something that's hard for you to hear, I totally understand. You can just skip this part of the video and I'll link down below where we will continue the rest of this video. Sally alleges that Ray would abuse her and the children. She said Ray choked her out many times in front of her children in the Netflix series, Sally's son, John, claims that he hated Ray. As a child, he wishes he would have fought back during the times that he saw his mother get abused. John claimed that Ray would whoop him with a belt when he didn't even do anything wrong. Shantina, their daughter, alleges that she also witnessed violence happening in the home. She remembers confronting her brother and them hiding in their bedroom with the headphones trying to zone out the fights. And that is really sad. When I was watching the documentary and even researching this, I know growing up, all parents fight and the older one usually feels the need to try to put headphones on or put on a funny show so that the little younger siblings are distracted. But when it's to the point where even the children were getting abused allegedly, I mean, that's just really sad. Ray's best friend, Dwayne, they call him DJ. He claims that Ray got into an altercation with another man one night while he was working at a nightclub. During this fight, Ray allegedly ended up sticking his fingers through the eyes of the man that he fought. Because of this, this man is blind now because of this fight and Ray ultimately ended up 
fleeing the scene. Shantina recalled seeing Ray come home covered in blood this night. He told her, quote, he had to do what he did because others were trying to kill him. You quickly realize that you can't speak solely about Ray's violence account that allegedly took place without also speaking of Sally. Sally's children, John and Shantina, also recount events of their mom being violent as well. According to John, he remembers his mother allegedly attacking somebody in their building on his behalf after he came home one day and told her about an incident that took place between him and this other person. And Sally literally went out of her way to go find this person and physically attack them. She also had been arrested for attacking one of the women that Ray was rumored to be cheating with, but We'll get to that in a second. A contributing factor to Ray's alleged violence, friends think could have been the fact that he was known to be on steroids. That's not alleged, he was on steroids. Well, because this wasn't a secret to Sally and his friends, it's no surprise that he was known to be a more violent because of this. But Ray's ultimate goal was to win Mr. Olympia by any means necessary. So by this point, he had already won the heavyweight and the overall titles in both the 1991 NPC California Championships and the 1991 IFBB North American Championships. Even if he was unhappy with Sally or vice versa, in terms of the bodybuilding world, they made a great team. The results were showing for Ray and he couldn't stop now. While he was training his hardest that he had ever trained before for Mr. Olympia, according to Sally, Ray was on the heaviest dose of steroids that he had ever been on. If you even Google any pictures from the Mr. Olympia competition, even to present day, these guys take being buff and swole to a whole nother level. These guys are huge. She admitted to even traveling to Mexico to refill for him on these steroids. She literally went to Mexico for this man to get his steroids. That is crazy to me. Ray was not only working out and training hard for the show, but he was emotionally very, very tense. He wasn't home as much anymore, and when he was home, he was just fighting with Sally, or he was fighting with the kids. Ray's best friends claimed to know that he was cheating during this time, which that's the whole bro code, right? They're gonna have each other's backs and not say anything. And they talk about this in the documentary. They knew him to go on trips with them and even just be around town with them. And of course, the way he looks, he's gonna attract women naturally just to talk to him, but he took it a step further and would actually cheat on Sally with these women and his best friends knew about it. There was one woman in particular who is the main mistress of this story. Her name was Marianne Myers. Ray claimed to be absolutely in love with her. They detailed to the police that her and Ray were very intimate they were in love. Ray would even spend full nights sleeping over at her house. Ray allegedly told Marianne he even hated Sally and wanted to ultimately end the marriage with her and be with Marianne instead. So let's fast forward to 1993. The Mr. Olympia competition is taking place. Ray shows up with his wife and his kids and immediately Sally notices that being backstage, Ray's body compared to some of the men he's competing against. Don't get me wrong, Ray's in shape and he looks great and he's trained really hard for this, but like I said, if you Google some pictures of this competition, these guys are huge and Ray was known to have smaller calves. Like that was just a fact. And standing up compared to these guys, it's crazy how he could be small compared to how huge these guys were. And Sally knew this and she already knew walking in there, being backstage, there's no way in hell 
my husband is gonna win this competition. And some might think that she walked in being negative, but she just knew from competing herself and just seeing these other guys that he was competing against that Ray would be lucky if he even places in this competition. I'm gonna ins insert some pictures here of like what he was competing against because it's kind of hard to just describe that. Ultimately, Ray places 15th place in the Mr. Olympia competition. And like I said, Sally just knew that he wasn't gonna win, but she never knew placing 15 would turn Ray's entire world upside down the way that it did. She claims that after this, he really wasn't ever even coming home anymore, not even during the day. He would be gone for days straight. His friends do attest at this point that he was full-blown living with Mary Ann, like how some of his clothes moved in, full-blown living with this woman. I just, I can't even wrap my mind around that. The absence was very obvious to Sally and her children, and tension really built in Sally. I think it would for any of us if, if any of our men, boyfriends, husbands, you know, and you have children in, in the picture, like you have a whole family and you're doing this, I think Honestly, any of us would have tension building up. Sally really did. Her tension built and built and built until one night everything just came to a tragic head. On February 14th, 1995, on Valentine's Day, instead of Sally and Ray dressing up and having a nice dinner and a romantic night together, the night would instead be filled with lies an affair that ultimately all just comes crashing down. Sally's version of events is that she took the kids swimming that day. They had a really, really fun day. And for once, it was without Ray. They laughed all day, they swam, They she took the kids to eat, and she said that the day just went by so fast and they just had so much fun that she really wasn't thinking about like where Ray was during the day until she got home. So at night, she figured they could do something romantic together um, after she already put the kids down for bed. But when he still wasn't home and the day already ended, she assumed that Ray was at their local bar called McCabe. And Sally figured, okay, maybe he's there, so I'll just get dressed and go down there. And again, this is all according to Sally's version of events. As she was getting dressed and doing her makeup in the bathroom, Ray walks in the door. He asked her, according to Sally, going somewhere? He didn't say hi, happy Valentine's Day, you look beautiful. He didn't say any of that. He asked her, going somewhere? And if he is having an affair and he does want to leave her, of course this doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. She replies, quote, well, yeah, I was going to find you. Ray was short with her because he was on a ton of steroids and he was three days away from a show. Shantina just remembers going to her room and then hearing her mom gasping and choking. Sally got really frustrated. She was telling him, you look like shit. You're not gonna place for the show. They got into a physical altercation. Sally said that when she got away from him, she ran into the bedroom to go and retrieve her gun. Sally said that she ultimately feared for her life because all the steroids he was on and she asked him to leave the house after they were fighting and he wouldn't leave. Keep that in mind, by the way, when forming your opinion and thinking about the trial that's gonna happen because this five to 10 minute altercation timeline when Sal what Sally says happened is very vital to her defense in her case. Because already a red flag is Ray saying no, that he's not gonna leave the house, and Sally says after this she walks away from him. 
the argument of self-defense becomes very, very shaky. After Sally asks Ray to leave the house, she says that she goes to the bedroom, she retrieves the shotgun, and she proceeds to shoot Ray. Ray falls after she shoots him one time in the abdomen, and then she loads the gun again and shoots him in the face. Shantina remembers running out of her room with a baseball bat. She thought at the time that Ray was shot, it was her mom that was shot. Even though Ray wasn't her biological dad, Shantina just remembers the smell of really strong metal, like almost pennies of Ray's blood as he was laying on the ground bleeding out. And even though Ray wasn't her biological dad and he was known to abuse the children, Shantina was devastated to see him on the floor. She was screaming. She was crying and screaming for help, for somebody to help them. John, her brother, stayed back in his room while all of this was happening. He said that there was a part of him that felt relieved and felt happy that Ray was on the ground and he was helpless. He felt like maybe now the abuse for him will finally stop. Sally claims that she ran to the room to go get a blanket to cover Ray's body, but keep in mind, he's still alive at this point. Sally calls 911, and the most disturbing part of the 911 call is Ray's in the background moaning. And if you look up the call on YouTube, you'll hear him very clearly in the background, just like, grum like grumbling and moaning, like he's in pain and you can hear Shantina screaming in the background. If you listen really close, you can hear Ray, you shot me, you didn't have to do that. At 2.59 a.m. on February 15th, Sally and her children went to the police station. They were separated on purpose to be interrogated. The children who are now grown, they are married and they have their own lives with their own children, say in the documentary how traumatizing it was for them even to this day to be separated from their mother like that. Sally explained to the police what happened right away from her point of view in her interview and there's a lot of discrepancies and things that she says that really really damage her case and her trial before it even gets started. To this day, Sally wishes that she would have gotten a lawyer instead of even talking to police. So remember earlier in the video when I said that she was being choked and then she ran into the room to go and retrieve the weapon after she asked Ray to leave? Since he wouldn't leave, she said that she shot him. In her interrogation, her story just begins to change. Now her story says that when he came home, he started cooking chicken. But remember when I told you in the beginning that she said the argument started after he asked her in the bathroom where she was going? Nowhere did she first mention that he had enough time to even go start cooking in the kitchen. After retrieving the weapon, she just wanted to threaten him and scare him with it while he was cooking. The police do sit Sally down and ultimately inform her that Ray didn't survive his injury. Ray McNeil died February 15, 1995. Sally's reaction to hearing this, she started crying, saying, oh God, what did I do? I murdered him. I wish I would have done it a different way. Please tell her that she's being arrested for murder. After getting this news, Sally, good old Sally, Sally's response to the police, which at this point, even if you want to believe her, when she says things like this, it is just really, really hard to. Her first question after being charged with murder was how long did they try? And the investigators are like, to revive him? To save him? And she's like, yes. How long did they try? 
And they're like, um, I don't know. So during the 911 call, Sally told the operator, quote, I just shot my husband because he beat me up. Sadly, in the background of the call, you can hear Shantina screaming and Ray moaning in pain. In the documentary, Sally explains that she was trying to be strong for her kids when she was being interrogated. She never thought that she would be charged in that same room and placed under arrest and separated from her kids for murder. She thought that this was plain and simple self-defense and everybody would see it that way. But of course, that's not what happened. She explains and now that her answers were awful and she wishes that she could go back and retain an attorney. She claims that she was in shock and she didn't realize that she should do that, which always, no matter what, since we live in the United States and we live in a country that you are innocent until proven guilty, Anytime you have a criminal charge against you, always, always, always retain an attorney. Around 9.45 a.m., remember, all of this happened the night of Valentine's Day. Sally didn't see her kids and be reunited with them until 9.45 a.m. the next day. She explains to her children that they are going to be separated for a little while from her and they are going to be going to Pennsylvania to live with her sister. For obvious reasons, this case made all the news headlines. Sally's bodybuilding pictures, her beautiful face, Ray's handsome face and all of his bodybuilding pictures, the media just ate this story up. The promotion of Sally's wrestling, private wrestling videos that she would do. One of the promotions that I'm gonna insert here had her dressed in all army gear and she was holding but not just any shotgun, the very same murder weapon. She was holding this. And during her trial, the prosecution claims that they didn't see her show any re remorse in her police interrogation interviews. In fact, there's video footage of Sally even taking a nap on the interview floor. The prosecution claims that she didn't appear battered, like she was hurting or something was sore or whatnot because she was comfortable enough to basically lay down on the floor, make a bed on the floor, and go to sleep. So, on February 18th, 1995, she has her initial hearing. She was appointed a public defender because she couldn't afford an attorney of her own, and she pled not guilty to her murder charges. One of the problems immediately going to trial was Sally's physical appearance, being a bigger woman and more muscular compared to other women who are wives, it seemed like she could put up a better fight than just the average wife, basically. The prosecution wanted $1.3 million in bail for her, and the defense was able to get it down to $800,000, and ultimately, Remember all those guys that I told you Sally would do private videos for, private wrestling meetings for? Yeah, those same guys posted her bail, people. She was bailed out for $800,000 by these guys. Court records did show a history of abuse of the police frequently going to Sally and Ray's home and a history of police reports. No charges were ever pressed on either side though. Ultimately, Ray's autopsy showed five types of steroids in his bloodstream at the time of his death. Ray's best friend DJ interviewed with the police and said the story of the big black guy on steroids attacking his white wife is not the true story. He said that they had multiple incidents that Ray told him of Sally being physically abusive towards Ray. 
It soon became a very common testimony of several witnesses for the prosecution that Sally was undoubtedly a violent person herself. Sally details how she would find love letters and women's phone numbers over the years being married to Ray. And when she would confront him, he would just tell her that he would end things with these women. He wouldn't even deny it when he was caught cheating or having these women's numbers. He just told her, okay, I'll end it, according to Sally. Ray's other best friend, Shannon Brown, said that he knew Ray got around. He said, like I said earlier, he always witnessed Ray with other women and when they would travel for shows, all kinds of women would want to meet him. And Shannon said that he really feared for his friend if Sally ever found out about how frequent his cheating really was. So at the Steel Rolls competition, Sally witnessed Ray flirting with another bodybuilder and she straight up confronted that woman and started beating her up. She said to her, quote, as she was punching her face, leave my husband alone, quote, you effed my husband. Ultimately, Ray's friends summed it up that Ray just did not love Sally in the way that he, she loved him. Friends testified that Sally would threaten Ray and he would tell her that he wants to leave. Friends say that Sally not only knew about the affair with Marianne, but she knew that he didn't want to be with her. She just didn't take heed to it. Sally does admit to calling his mistress Marianne and threatening her, which again, if you can sympathize her, for her, for Sally, that her husband was a POS and he cheated on her, it's it's hard when she's doing stuff like this too, threatening, making threats to this woman that he was cheating on her with. It just, it doesn't help her case when it goes to trial. His friends testified that they told Ray, Sally is gonna hurt you if you don't end things in the right way, or even if you do end things, with her and you do try to have a divorce with her, they said that they genuinely feared for his life because they saw before this happened, allegedly, that Sally would hurt him before she ever let him divorce her. Sally claims that she doesn't know where Ray was on Valentine's Day. Everyone, all of his friends say that he was with Marianne and Sally knew he was with Marianne and that she was well aware, but Sally says that she didn't she didn't know where he was and she genuinely didn't know that Marianne was his girlfriend still at this point. Sally claims that it's not fair that he gets to beat her and then he just gets to go and fool around. She does say that in the Netflix documentary. So again, that statement alone doesn't help her case. He says in the video that her expectation of Valentine's Day is that you spend it with your husband, not with your whore. So regardless whose side of the story that you're believing so far, it's very obvious that the marriage did have violence on both parts. Steroids were a factor being used by both of them and there was an affair going on. There's no need to say allegedly for that part because it's a fact that Ray was having an affair with Marianne. It's also a fact that Sally knew who Marianne was because there is proof that she called her and threatened her. And Sally even admits to threatening Marianne. So ultimately, all these reasons to divorce each other and not be together, it's a fact that they ended up staying married and being together. Fast forward to the trial, the prosecution and the defense have to now best put together these facts with building a timeline of what happened on Valentine's Day that night 
when Ray McNeil walked into that door of their home and what happened between him coming back from being with Marianne to his initial altercation with Sally. They have to put together a timeline with the facts that they have of what led to his murder that night. The timeline so far is that Ray goes to Marianne's on Valentine's Day. The approximate time is not known, but he did contact his friend DJ around 9 o'clock p.m. and asked him to meet him at his house. Ray's friend DJ got there to their house about 9.15 p.m. and he said at this time he was on the phone with his wife. He goes to the door and he knocks and Sally opens the door. Sally says that Ray isn't here. And DJ said, okay, well, I'm gonna go grab a bite to eat. By the time I get here, he should be back. And Sally said, don't do that. You really need to stay here. And DJ was like, why do I need to stay here? I'm literally gonna go grab food around the corner. I'll, I'll be right back. And so he left and he says to this day that he regrets doing that instead of staying there. DJ said that by the time that he comes back, he sees Sally talking to the police and there's a swarm of cop cars and a helicopter. The timeline of Ray coming home with the intent of breaking up with Sally, it was clear. Sally was devoted and loyal to him, but he was not to her. Sally had a breaking point that night. She went and retrieved the weapon when there was not an active threat at the time of her retrieving the weapon. Because between her story changing when she retrieved it and the reason of the argument that night, self-defense is just not enough of an argument in court for the jury. So one year later, ironically on February 14th, 1996, began the trial of Sally McNeil for the murder of her husband, Ray McNeil. The prosecution's main argument was that Sally, in a jealous rage, killed Ray. The defense argued Sally feared for her life. Ray was shot a total of two times, once in the abdomen and once in the face. Because Sally went and reloaded the gun after Ray was already down, and that happened after the first shot, there's no way that fear of her life could be true because according to the autopsy, the fatal injury shot was the first shot. So Ray was down. There was no way that he could get up after the first shot and hurt her again to the point where she was in fear for her life. The defense did not have a expert to rebuttal the shot to Ray's face as to why Sally reloaded and shot again, shooting Ray in the face. This ended up hurting her case a lot. Sally's attorney still argued that Sally had battered woman syndrome, that she was eval evaluated and that she was found to be having signs of being a battered woman. And again, as a battered woman by definition, Sally did have these issues in her marriage. The argument though of needing to save herself and her life, and at the time of the argument when she shot him, it doesn't, it doesn't prove to be self-defense with the battered, even with her being a battered woman. Let's take a pause. If you find yourself feeling sorry for Sally listening to this story, but then you also look at all the evidence against her in the case, and you have to understand that the jurors do have a responsibility at the end of the day to convict and hold somebody accountable for taking the life of another human being. Being. and they have to look at the facts and see if it was justified or not at the time of the crime. Sally's 
last and final horrific blow to her case was when she decided to take the stand. Her own lawyer did not want her to take the stand. She did it anyway. And he claims that she portrayed herself as a hardcore Marine when she got up there and took the stand. She said, yes ma'am, no ma'am, very matter of fact. She didn't show any emotions on the stand. She didn't cry. She didn't show any kind of remorse. So the prosecution, what happens when the victim takes the stand is of course, your defense lawyer gets to ask you questions, but guess what? Since you took the stand, the prosecution has their opportunity to cross-examine, and let's just say the prosecution went in on Sally. They asked her to answer to her own admission, do you own a gun? Sally said yes. Do you know how to shoot a gun? Sally said yes. Were you trained in the military to shoot guns? Sally said yes. Did you willingly point the gun at Ray McNeil and fire? Yes. Did you know how to aim the gun, load the gun, and shoot Ray McNeil? Yes. Did you reload after Ray McNeil was on the ground and not a threat to you and shoot again? Yes. This was awful to her. The prosecution then asked Sally, does she go by Killer Sally? Remember that promotion that I told you about? While she was, she was holding the murder weapon while she was dressed up in military, like, uniform, promoting her private wrestling videos. She got asked by the prosecution, does she go by Killer Sally? She said no. Since she lied by saying she did not go by Killer Sally, which she in fact did, the prosecution was now able to use that evidence, which before it was excluded and not to be used because the defense felt like it was irrelevant to the case. So the judge granted that and allowed that particular poster to not be presented during the trial. Because Sally said no, the prosecution now had complete access to ex include that in the trial now and sally's defense to her saying no said i was playing a character i don't go by killer sally i was playing the character but it doesn't matter she said no and it was a lie so the poster which i will include right here of her posting with the actual murder weapon and the title underneath her saying killer sally was sealed for the jury on march 19th 1996 more than one year after the murder of ray mcneil sally mcneil was found guilty of second degree murder she was sentenced to 19 years to life second degree murder is the intent to kill someone unlawfully there's no excuse or justification. Ultimately, the juror found that there was no imminent danger to kill him. After five parole board hearings, she was granted release. So ultimately, after serving 25 years in prison, Sally McNeil was released in the summer of 2020. The very first place Sally went to after being released was McDonald's. She had no home, of course, so she went and stayed at a veterans center in California. She was reuni reunited with her daughter since not seeing her since 2004. Her son, John, however, has still chosen to not see her. He said that after she went to prison and he had to grow up without her, he suffered a lot of mental trauma. He and Shantina both ended up being in the Marines at one point in their life and they served the military and 
they he said that this created a lot of PTSD for him and now that he has kids he doesn't want anything to do with his past having to be in any part of his kids lives now Sally remarried to a man named Stuart and they currently reside in California together and that is where this story basically ends it's very sad what happened and I think that it raises the topics of childhood trauma abuse affairs rehabilitation after prison self-defense bodybuilding competitions and the use of steroids just all kinds of topics and these are my thoughts I do believe that Sally was a victim of abuse as a child and in her marriage. I also believe though that Sally was just as violent in her marriage. I think that Ray did not help his wife's past trauma and helping her heal from that by cheating on her so openly when she already suffered from mental health abuse and trauma and she already needed healing and help on her own. He didn't help for, with that, he just added to it. I think Sally wanted that perfect family so bad that she was willing to sacrifice her own mental sanity just to stay in a relationship with Ray. She would have rather gone through that pain than the pain of losing him or losing that image of her and her family looking perfect. She didn't know how to love herself enough um, or where to even begin to get out of something like that um, because it was all that she had known all her life. In the eyes of the jury at the time of his death i think that they saw it as ray was just not an active threat when she shot off that gun he may have been seriously at one point if he was choking her out at one point or beating her in the way that the kids remember and she says as well but when it came time for her to actually defend herself she did it at a time where he was already down and there wasn't a need for her to um, go retrieve and reload her gun again let alone shoot him the first time I don't I don't think he was there to hurt her in my opinion I think he was there to leave her and I think it upset her so bad to the point that it was Valentine's Day and he's breaking up with her that she went and retrieved the weapon and and murdered her husband it's really sad for the kids that ray lost his life and sally is now rehabilitated back into society so i really want to know your thoughts on that because she did her time she was charged but now she's remarried she's living a new life and i want to know i really want to know your thoughts and opinions on that in the comments below so Everybody share how you feel below. I will definitely be reading the comments because I'm super interested to know what you guys think. And just be kind to each other in the comments and make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. I am new to the true crime world, but I am so happy to be here. And I love all the OG true crime channels that have came before me. And so I hope that I am one now that you can add to your list and watch. So thank you so much for tuning into this video. And I will see you guys all in the next one. Until then, stay safe. Thanks. Bye.